Yep, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> Secret to ministry. Some is the Holy Spirit, others, you know, magic pockets. <laughs> and I'm going to need both of them today because we, we've got a challenging topic to discuss. I want to first start off by just welcoming everybody to the room and just thank you so much for coming. And if you're new here to Grace City especially, thanks for being here. And uh, to all the families that are rocking here with ki kids, thank you so much for, for jumping into this moment. We know it's a little chaotic and frustrating, but this is a good just time to be together, even though it may not be perfectly ideal. So thanks for making this awesome. And anyone that's watching online, thank you also for tuning in and being a part of this moment as well. You matter to us deeply, and even though you may not be able to be here in person, we're so glad you are where you need to be, and you can join us here in spirit and by faith. So thank you guys all for being here in this moment. Um, we are in a series called Divided, and it's a series that's specifically designed to talk about the things that are dividing us, and there's many of them. They are legion. So there is just so many ways in which the devil has found footholds to bring us apart, and uh, sometimes division is necessary because you, you have to talk about tough things that are actually going to call out things that we need to reconcile and deal with, and other times it's completely unnecessary because we're finding ourselves just talking past each other and not really finding common ground or, or um, a meaningful respect or a healthy dialogue between one another. And one of the things that the elders and I, the leadership team here of the church, that have processed through this very difficult time is how much do we say or how much do we not say? What do we say? What do we say indirectly? What do we say directly? Wanting to think about God's heart of how to shepherd this church. And what, it's just becoming fairly clear as the months have gone on and as we head into even an election season and all, all these things, that the more that we don't speak on things, though there can be the fear that it will actually only bring more division or maybe emotionally trigger us to like hear things that we're maybe not intending to say and just maybe offer up greater opportunities for, for hurt and pain and so forth. But I've just become increasingly dissatisfied with the idea that everything but your local church is going to help disciple you into thinking about the world around you. Jesus should have that say, and the local church is meant to be a part of that journey, and the fact that we would just simply uh, not talk about it means we're going to completely assign it to Fox News and CNN and social media and maybe your friends with crazy ideas or, or, or whatever else, and we want to make sure that Jesus has a voice in that formation process, and that is even coming from here in the most faithful and loving way possible. And so realizing this is, hasn't been nor will be easy conversations that we have, hoping that God's Spirit is going to help us to have them in a gracious, truthful, and humble way. A couple of weeks ago, I had my good friend Donnell Jones here to help us start on the race conversation. And last week, I addressed it a bit more generally, talking about if race is indeed a gospel issue, meaning is it central to the mission of Jesus? And we answered that in the affirmative and helped to unpack why that is and some of the theology behind that. But this week, I wanted to be able to speak more than just generally. I wanted to speak specifically and to talk about what specifically uh, the race issue, if you want to call it that, um, means to us here at Grace City, what it means to us here as Oregonians. And even if you're not a native Oregonian or you're not from here or you've only been here a short amount of time, well, you are here now. And there's a lot that gets, I think there's, there's a relatively more that is known about more of our national history or maybe even more of Western culture in general, but not always as much about the specifics of things here locally. And at all, at all times, I think it's far more pertinent to consider that which is closest to you and nearest to your world because it's easier to fixate on the things that are beyond you and bigger than you and not realize that there's some things actually very, very near to us that have affected the environments in which we live. And so I want to take some time to talk about our state and the issues that it's had with race over the years um, and, uh, and, uh, and then speak about what the heart of Grace City is, not just myself, but our elders, staff, and leaders, and all you amazing members here of Grace City, what our heart is uh, moving forward. With all that being said, I want to start with the scriptures here this morning, and I want to start in Nehemiah of all books, chapter 9. Nehemiah, if you haven't read Nehemiah, go do yourself a favor and go read Nehemiah this week. It's a phenomenal book uh, in the Old Testament, and uh, it's, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on it, and then I want to talk about Nehemiah chapter 9 here in a moment. And here's why this is going to set this moment up. Nehemiah is written in a very specific moment of the nation of Israel's history. They are uh, God's people that he's made a covenant with that somehow it's through this nation of people God's going to bring restoration to the world. He's somehow going to bring a savior out of this people that's going to put everything back to right in the world. That's been the plan so far in the Old Testament. But 
God's people, quote unquote, have not been so faithful to him, though God's been incredibly faithful to them, that it has not been reciprocated. And so, the long story of Israel's journey comes to almost its conclusion in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah. It's one of the last historical moments we get of God's people before the New Testament begins. This is still a few hundred years before the arrival of Jesus, but it's the last historical moment we get to really see of what's going on in their story. Now, early in their story, through Abraham and many of his sons, Israel actually became people that actually uh, oppressed and took slaves and were disobedient to God in all kinds of ways and yet were faithful to him and trusted him in all kinds of other crazier ways. But that led eventually to their enslavement in the nation of Egypt. And they were slaves for 400 years. And that famous story of the book of Exodus where God rescued them from slavery to bring them back into their own land and to establish them as a kingdom. God did that. And as God established them as a kingdom, they had a few years where things went okay, but mostly things went off the rails, and they did so relatively quickly. Israel continued to to give themselves away to other gods, to worship idols, to give false worship, and to uh, give their hearts away to gods that did not love them or rescue them the way, indeed, uh, the God of Israel did. And along with that, they started mimicking the practices of many of the other nations rather than setting themselves apart as a unique nation that it was embodying God's values, God's heart for how to govern and lead. And so the ideas of oppression or corruption or misusing or abusing the poor or exploitation, all these things became very normative in the kingdom of Israel. And king after king after king, uh, things just didn't get better. So much so that God actually brought judgment upon them and severe judgment upon them because their calling was not only to walk faithfully with God, but it was also to be a model for other nations of what God was like and what it meant to live life as faithful partners with God. And on both counts, they just utterly, utterly failed. And so the punishment that God brought was exile. And the kingdom of Israel was exiled, the northern end of Syria, the southern kingdom, into Babylon. And in Babylon, God's people are in a foreign land trying to somewhat stay faithful to God, but it's really, really difficult when you don't have kind of the home, uh, home team sort of territory issue. And there was all kinds of challenges that came through that, some of which we'll talk a little bit more next week. But Nehemiah is a character that has been exiled to Babylon, and it's gone on for multiple years, and he's one of the first people that initiated the move to actually see God release them from exile and bring them back into their homeland. And Nehemiah's main project was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, their home city. And the walls had been fallen apart, and it was, a, it was a sign of like honor and glory and like to have this, the walls of the city. It wasn't just for practical defense against your enemies, but it was also a, like a statement of pride about our city and taking ownership of who we, are, who we actually were. And so Nehemiah's main project was to rebuild the walls of the city, although he did it with great opposition. Uh, and he demonstrated actually pretty extraordinary levels of leadership in order to get that done. But as Nehemiah and the people around him start to resettle in the city of Jerusalem, it starts to stoke up a lot of the trauma that they've been through and a lot of the pain of their past. And they're realizing they can rebuild the walls, but Nehemiah was godly enough to know that no matter how great the walls are, that unless God's presence dwells with them, it means nothing. No matter how strong the walls are, unless it's God himself who is protecting the people, the walls are going to mean nothing. They can fall down again. And so there's moments of worship and there's moments of repentance and there's moments where Nehemiah comes with the people to do business with God and to reckon with their painful history of unfaithfulness. And in Nehemiah chapter 9 is where we get an account of one of these really, really powerful moments, which says this. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads, all signs of mourning. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all the foreigners, and they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. So one of the things they had to do was just acknowledge that Okay, we can rebuild the structure of the city, but there's something really spiritually broken about this whole thing. And so Nia started by just simply rewinding the clock and saying, like, hey, some things really went off the rails here. And unless we pay attention to those things, we're just going to repeat those patterns into the future. And one of the interesting things that Nehemiah does is he doesn't just confess his own sins or he doesn't just confess the sins of that current moment but also acknowledges his ancestors, those that have actually gone before him. 
those that have kind of laid the structural like platform onto which he is now trying to restore. Now, it's a fascinating idea because nowhere in the scripture are we directly commanded to confess the sins of like our forefathers, our people that have gone before us. That's not commanded anywhere in the scripture. However, there are passages like this here in Nehemiah that model it for us. That the scriptures are very clear that you and I are accountable for our sins. That ultimately before God's judgment seat, that's, that is what we have to reckon with. That there isn't the sin of anyone else that needs to come into focus as we stand before our creator to face accountability for the life that we lived. And then if we do so without the blood of Christ covering us, that we're going to be directly responsible for that, and that's not going to go well. But the scriptures are very clear. And it was actually a radical move of justice, that sons don't pay for the sins of their fathers. But that being said, the scriptures also paint the picture that to simply say, well, okay, though that is how God might deal with us, to say somehow that the sins of our fathers don't impact the lives that we live now, that the way things have been don't affect the way things are, well, that would be foolishness. And it is more of a modern Western construct to think of ourselves as very isolated individuals that are just the sum total of all of our own decisions and things that we've done, and not taking into account all the things that have happened before us, the shoulders that we stand upon, or the way, like the way in which the table has been set before we ever got to it. And so where the Bible leads us to in humility is just to consider, well, what has happened before me so that I may deliberately choose to either participate in the good things or to not participate in the bad things? This is actually critically important. I think this is important to do on a family level, to actually think through the generational patterns you have in your family, to be mindful of it. If you have a history of alcoholism in your family, for, for instance, maybe you should be careful about the way in which your relationship with alcohol looks, not because you're responsible for like, the sin of other people, but you, you need to be aware that maybe this is a pattern, and so I need to be mindful of that. Maybe you've got an incredible family history of people that have been really hardworking or have done some really great things in the community. And maybe that's stuff you, you need to be mindful of so that you hold on to that, that you don't just retreat into your selfish shell and you actually carry on that legacy. And that's what I believe the people of God are doing. They're taking stock of all that God wants to do through them and all the ways that they've failed so that they can be more faithful to their calling in the future. And with that same spirit and with that being modeled, I do believe we're in a moment now where we would do well to think with godly wisdom about the moment we're in, exactly how we got here, holding on to the good and calling out the bad so that the patterns we live out moving forward can look more like the kingdom of God and less like the kingdom of men. So with that being said, I want to talk about a few things that might be a little bit uncomfortable, especially as we talk about things that are very, very close to home close to home in terms of the state of Oregon, and the history that we've had here. Some of you might know some of this. Some of you may have never seen anything like this before. But I want to show you just exactly at least a thread of the story. It's not the entire story. And history is like that. You can cherry pick events to tell a narrative in almost any direction you want at times. But there for sure is a story that must be acknowledged, in particular with uh, African descendants of slaves, and in more generally people of color in the state. So to do so, let's just start with a couple things that have happened in our history, starting with uh, 1844, where the first of what are known as the exclusionary laws were put into place. Now, this is prior to the Civil War, and Oregon was established as a non-slavery state, which we might feel like, oh, great, we were uh, not down with slavery. Well, that's cool. Yes, but the catch to that is they just didn't want any black people here, whether they be slaves or freed slaves or whatever that would look like. And so there was actually a ban placed on black people from living here for more than three years. Furthermore, anyone that did live here for more than three years, there was a punishment of 39 lashes that would occur every six months until they left. So however you got here, however you stayed here, like the issue was don't get comfortable. This isn't your home. And this law was one in which made that extremely, extremely Explicit. Now, there's debate about how much or if that was, this was ever even enforced, but nonetheless, this was, this was on the books. Move forward just five years, next slide, and in 1849, they actually tightened the law even more so by saying that anyone not already living in the state of Oregon was not allowed to move in 
The consistency of the message was that this was trying to be preserved as a state of primar primarily European descent and people of color, and specifically African descendants of slaves, not wanted here. Next slide. Now, when you move to 1859, that's the year that Oregon officially became a state on February 14th, Valentine's Day, easy enough to remember. Uh, we uh, ratified our state constitution, and in our state constitution, we actually prohibited uh, black people from owning land and making uh, legal contracts. Now, what's unique about this is that it's actually into the legal language of our state. Meaning that there's a lot of shady things that happened in this period of time in America, but not a lot of it was actually written down. It was just kind of in the water of culture, if you will. And so there was a lot of things carried on by people and practices and ways that people carried out discrimination and so forth. But we actually ratified it. We codified it. We actually wrote this down. And this is all happening prior to the Civil War. As tensions are rising in the nation and the Civil War is starting to mount of North versus South, Oregon is making very, very clear, like, hey, we don't want any part of this conflict and tension. I think this is a pattern that actually carries on to this day. We want to remain outside all of this tension by simply keeping out all like people of color and like allowing this to be as homogenous of a state as possible. Now move forward from this moment, next slide, and you'll realize that uh, in 1890, the population of black people in the entire state was only 1,000 people, which actually makes a ton of sense why there would be so few, and also, how many of you would just love to have a chat with those 1,000? Like, whoa, seriously, what was it like, and what, why did you stay, and why did you come? I just think there's a 1,000 fascinating stories in 1890 that I would love to love to hear. Now move forward from 1890, and even though the Civil War has been fought, it's ended, the 13th Amendment has been ratified, freeing the slaves, you still have the same general pattern happening in Oregon, and it just gets manifested in different ways. One of the most prominent ways you see it manifested is in the representation of the KKK in our state, which was among the highest west of the Mississippi. In fact, Oregon had one of the highest per capita memberships of the KKK, and it was roughly around 4% of our state population at the time. Now, this was mostly distributed down in southern Oregon, but was represented across the state, and there was even politicians and significant public figures that had noted public relationships with leaders of the KKK. And all of this continues to speak to just how unwelcome non-white people are here. Next slide which shows you that even though the state had been radically increasing in its population, the population of black people in the state was not. There were only 2,000 black people here by 1920. Now, the only significant uh, growth of black people in our state happened around World War II, where as a lot of the soldiers left for battle, there were a lot of needs left in cities, including the city of Portland. So jobs in the shipyard, and a lot of industrial jobs that a lot of African Americans flooded into to take those jobs. But even as they did so, there was incredible tension and discrimination in the city. They were relegated uh, to a specific part of Portland that would later be flooded. It was not great land. And so there were all kinds of discriminatory practices held in place. And as the war concluded, the mayor of Portland is on record essentially saying, like, all right, y'all, we don't need you anymore. Please leave. This wasn't just true of African descendants of slaves. This was also true of the Japanese and the Chinese and other people of color as well. That Oregon is just has this established history of trying to maintain Oregon as as white of a state as possible. And you can look at all the progress that you're seeing happen, both from the Civil War and the 13th Amendment, and even the challenging of various laws that are happening during this time. But this is kind of the nature of sin. This is the nature of racism, that it tends to just morph and evolve with the times, and that laws make a difference, but the hearts are slow to actually change and keep up with laws. This is actually like one of the central themes in the Bible itself. Of all the 613 laws you see given in the Old Testament, one of the primary things that the laws of the Old Testament are meant to communicate is that humans just are lawbreakers. In fact, the laws that God gives just show how bad we are at keeping the laws. Either we break them directly or we find loopholes around them because the issue isn't just better laws, but the issue in the Bible is the human heart. And when we don't want to love God or love our neighbor as ourselves, we'll always find loopholes away around doing the thing that God asks us to do. The classic example of this in the Trimmer household of the last few months is that we have a law in our home 
about screens, uh, which is just the constant thing. Everyone's, I, I hear from people a lot, well, the Bible just has so many rules. I think it doesn't have enough. <laughs> like, I think there should be way more. One of which should be, tell me what to do with the screen time of my children. Please tell me, God. That would be amazing. But one of the laws that we have in our home with screens is that I was never allowed to have any sort of screen, television, or anything like that in my room growing up. That was supposed to be like a family atmosphere environment. So at the very least, you were forced to deal with other people in your family if you wanted to watch TV or so forth. I've imposed that brutal and horrific law upon my own children, and I don't allow them to have any screens inside the room. They don't charge them in the room. They don't get to use them in the room. It at least says if you're going to be dialed in individualistically to your device, you're going to be at least in an environment where you're around other people, where you can at least feel their presence, hear them, even if it's just grunts. That's the idea of it. My children have heard this law and the explanation of this law, and their solution to this law has been to lay down on the floor with their feet inside their room and their torso outside the room as they're on their devices, looking happily up at me like, Dad, I'm in my room, or sort of, but I'm not in my room on my device. Look, my device is not in my room. But you get the point. That's not the point of the law, right? They found a way around it to technically fulfill it and still yet break it. And this seems to be the pattern of humanity, not just in the scriptures, but even outside the scriptures. We find ways of getting around it or technically satisfying it. And so even as progress has been made legally, you still see Oregon very, very resistant in terms of their desire to welcome or include or be hospitable or deal righteously with people of color in the state. Now, you fast forward to today, and you start looking at the demographics of our state, and in 2019, the black population in Oregon was 2%. And I remember thinking about this as a kid, and I remember even my high school teachers talking about this as we would talk about civil rights and some of the history of our state. And one of the common excuses that was given about the lack of minorities in Oregon, uh, not by my teachers, but my teachers talking about excuses that had been made in our history's past, it's kind of the glib comment, well, like, it rains a lot here, and black people don't like rain. Um, which actually, in my friendship group at least, that's actually very true. But that aside, it's almost this glib little, like, statement that just, like, completely, like, like, smooths out or covers over all the history that I explained. Like, why would there be a significant population of minorities in the state when the state was specifically designed in so many ways to exclude them? You had to really like work against the grain and run uphill to actually be someone that made a life here. In the earlier days of Oregon settlement, uh, there was land that was actually distributed to white men and white families if you were married, but specifically excluded from people of color. And even when you start talking about redlining or you talk about uh, lending practices that happened in the state of Oregon, there's just been specific and intentional efforts to make sure that people of color couldn't make their long-term home here and thrive. Now, when you look at the stats for Corvallis specifically, our black population is 1%. And we can either just kind of say like, well, it just kind of is what it is. I guess people just live where they want to live. Or we can just look back at the history and say, yeah, that actually makes sense. And sometimes there's moments where like 1%, God bless them because I don't know how I could do it. That's not easy. As someone who's grown up in this city, who's had a little bit of a unique upbringing in that because of athletics, I have actually had meaningful friendships and relationships with people of color. And then having played football at this uh, university in town, it's given me like, the largest like African-American like demographic we have in town, at least in terms of concentration, exposure to it, and meaningful relations with many, many awesome people. It's opened my eyes to see that there are often very times two different lived experiences in this city. For example, when I walked through campus as a college student, when I did, uh, I could walk through in all my Oregon State gear and clearly announce to the world that I'm an athlete here at Oregon State um, and I can get all the eyes and all the attention when I do so, and some days that felt good, but most days as an introvert, it didn't. And so I knew that all I had to do was take off my football warm-ups and sweats and football t-shirts and hats and backpacks and everything else. All I had to do was take that off 
and uh, throw in a black t-shirt and jeans, you know what I mean, and just blend right in. And I could, because for all intents and purposes, I just look like a generic white kid. You wouldn't believe that I ran a 4440, and I don't blame you. <clears throat> but for so many of my African-American friends, that was never the case. It didn't matter if they wore their team gear or not their team gear. They got looked at and gained attention everywhere that they went. That is just a minor example of a lot of the tensions that can be experienced as a significant small minority in the majority culture. And it just makes a difference and it makes an impact. I say all this to say specifically as a white guy, the history I've just recalled grieves me. It's not okay. I lament that this is the history of such a beautiful place that I love and call home. That even my very affection for the state and my ability to call it home is at least somewhat unique in terms of how easily I can do that. And I can take account of my life for my own decisions, hard work, and moral choices to an extent. But you have to ignore some really obvious things in the history of the state to not acknowledge that it has not been an even playing field in terms of making this a place where you can build a company or a career or a family and truly lay down your foundations to make this a place what you would call home. It grieves me. And I know I'm not the only one in this room. I know I'm not the only white person in this room. And I'm representing the elders when I say this. I'm representing the leaders when I say this. But for everything that's been done by people that have looked like me, to people of color and specifically to African descendants of slaves, please forgive us. It was sin and it was wrong. I wish I knew how to make it all right and better. I wish I knew the perfect politician and policy to just put into place. But I don't. But what I do know is that unless and until we just start with an acknowledgement of what is wrong, we're going to blindly barrel into our future and be very susceptible to maybe not overtly, but at least in terms of the cultural spirit of our state, carry on the same exclusivity and inhospitality and unwelcomeness that has been pervasive. And moreover, when I think about Grace City specifically and what it means to respond in a moment like this, in a city like this, well, there's a lot from our history as a church that I am delighted I get to stand on the shoulders of. Pastors, men and women, leaders of this church that have gone out of the way to make sure Grace City is an inclusive place, both for people of color, internationals, people from all different walks of life and cultures, and in different seasons of our 35 years of history. We've done this with varying degrees of success We've had people of color on staff and as elders and as all kinds of amazing leaders, even senior pastors. And I've found that this, this is not me trying to reveal my woke credentials to you. I care. I have so little cares about that. Because this moment will fade and the hashtags will disappear. But over 20 years of being a part of this community and being discipled by two amazing black men, I've realized just how significant this is to the heart of God. And being a community that resists the culture of inhospitality and exclusivity with hospitality and inclusion, not just for the sake of tokenism, but actually seeing people empowered to their full potential and purpose that God would have for them, runs, it runs deep in me. I wish I could tell you it was innate in me as a good like, kid growing up in a very progressive state. 
But it was discipleship, people leading me into the gospel and real life, in-person human relationships that developed this in me. As I was praying for and preparing this week, the Lord actually reminded me as I was praying, I had totally spaced on this. But in my first uh, term at seminary, um, grad school for pastors, my first term at seminary, my first big paper that I ever wrote was how to reach and empower African-American students with the gospel at Oregon State University. I look back now, like, well, what? There wasn't all this, like, Black Lives Matter stuff going on then. There wasn't all this cultural pressure going on. Like, what was it? Like, no, it's it's just the gospel. And a culture that was here that I was raised up here in Grace City to care about people that didn't like me. And some weird, unique, like, thing that God did where I couldn't lead a white dude to Jesus to save my life, but baptize many black teammates over and over again. Can't explain it. But you know, there's just God does things sometimes to mess with you in very good ways. So my heart for this church, our heart for this church, far beyond me, is to not just allow our interests to be piqued, to pick which side of the cultural divide that we're on, to pick which yard sign we want to display in this specific season, It's to continue the legacy of men and women that have laid down their life, had awkward conversations, dealt with their disagreements, walked through reconciliation, asked for forgiveness, freely given it as they received it from Jesus, and built a community that has been disproportionately representative of the diversity in the city. And I want to see that legacy continue. And the legacy of being inhospitable and unwelcome and essentially telling people, you're not welcome here can't make your home here. I don't know how to transform the state of Oregon or the city of Corvallis, but I do know we're called to be a unique city within the city, a city of grace, a city where we're actually modeling something different in the midst of this city. And in a city that's as progressive, and I put that in air quotes, as Corvallis and our broader state can be, because of our demographics, it's easy to speak about that and to say how much we believe in that without actually having to walk through the tensions of what real diversity means. I'm more committed not to just having a good website or brochure. I'm committed to being disciples that are known by the love they have for one another and specifically by counteracting the narrative of this city and state by being a city of grace within the city and state modeling what the gospel can do. To draw small town, conservative, white people and people of color that come in through any number of means or reasons into this area and allow the gospel of Jesus to bring us together. The good news of a brown man in the Middle East that's the true king of the world. And it sure seems like This is the good news. This is the good news that many in our state long for. But this is the good news that we believe that exclusively King Jesus can help us bring.